All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. We're a couple minutes after seven. I wanna welcome everyone to this evening and thank you for joining us. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just wanna give a quick shout out that uh, after the start of the new year in 2023, we're gonna be starting to put out our leadership applications for next year, for next year's fellows. So if you're interested in being one of us, uh, definitely fill out the application that we will send out. And new next year, we're actually going to be looking for one, possibly two uh, research residents to join our crew and help us put on this amazing, amazing education for everyone. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. We have Dr. Alessandra Geisher. She is a triple board certified surgeon in critical care, general, and colon and rectal surgery. She earned her medical degree at KCUMB in Kansas City, Missouri, followed by residency training at Kansas University Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. She then completed a surgical scholar fellowship and pediatric trauma critical care fellowship at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, a pediatric minimally invasive surgery fellowship and pediatric colorectal fellowship at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. And then Dr. Geisher completed an adult colorectal surgery fellowship at The Ohio State University. She currently practices pediatric and adult colorectal surgery at Ohio State University and uh, their Children's Hospital, Nationwide Children's Hospital. Her career interests are congenital colorectal transitional programs for pediatric and adult uh, patients, particularly in anorectal malformations, Hirschsprung's disease, and inflammatory bowel disease. And we are welcoming her this evening to talk about pediatric colorectal surgery, which is a topic on both the written and oral uh, colorectal surgery boards. So pay attention because you may be asked about this in the mm -hmm. future. And Dr. Geisher. Thank you so much for that wonderful um, introduction. So I'm going to get started here. We have a lot to go through in a short period of time. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about anorectal malformations. This incidence is one in 5,000 live births. It does have a wide spectrum of high and low fistulas that we'll go through in just a moment here. The classification is based on anatomy and it's different for males and females. So interrectal malformation or imperfect anus as it was previously called is divided into whether the patient is male or female as to what kind of uh, disease process they have. Um, <clears throat> if the patient had atresia or stenosis, versus if it's a rectourethral fistula in a male, it's divided into bulbar, prostatic, or bladder neck fistula, or if they have a perineal fistula, as well as cloacal extrophy is also um, a component of anorectal malformation in males. In females, uh, they can have an anal atresia or stenosis, or rectovestibular fistula, or a cloaca, as well as a perineal. The cloaca is then uh, further divided into short channel and long channel. And there are other variants of cloacal extrophy, bladder extrophy, and then cloacal variants that we see as well. So looking at what a, a female perineal fistula looks like here. Um, as you can see here, this is the bladder. And this is a patient who has three openings of orifices on the perineum. So there's a urethra, a vagina, and a rectum. The rectum is, uh, has an opening on the perineum, however, instead of into the sphincter complex, as you can see here. So this opening is anterior to the sphincter complex. So the surgery involves moving this into the sphincter complex so the patient can be um, continent for stool. So you can see the, the uh, fistula here, the perineal fistula, and you can see the urethra and the vagina. So this is a very important inspection to do on these patients in the newborn NICU. A vestibular fistula, as you are, are shown here, is where the rectum is inserted far more anteriorly. In fact, it's within the vestibule of the vagina. So you have the urethral opening, the vaginal opening, and then the fistula here within the vestibule of the vagina. And you can appreciate, <coughs> excuse me, that the patient should have uh, the sphincter complex back here, and we verify that with uh, muscle nerve stimulation. And again, here on the side view, the, the sphincter complex is all the way back here, but the anal opening is far more anterior. On a cloaca patient, these patients only have one opening. So they have the bladder, the vagina, and the rectum, all openings to a single common channel, which is far away from the sphincter complex. So our job from an anatomic standpoint 
is to separate these and give the full uh, perineal uh, openings for these patients. And on exam here, you can see there's a dimple here, perhaps where it should be, but then when you spread the area uh, of the labia, there is just a single opening orifice. Going to onto males, there's a perineal fistula, and these patients usually have a small bead of meconium or stool that passes within that first 24 hours of life, but you can appreciate that the sphincter complex is truly back here. With the rectourethral fistula, that is uh, divided further into rectobulbar and rectoprostatic. And on, this is where the rectum is inserting on the bulbar part of the urethra, and the sphincter is back here. And on the rectoprostatic, the rectum inserts on the prostatic part of the urethra. And uh, finally, a patient with a bladder neck fistula, the rectum inserts directly into the bladder neck. The concepts of continence for these patients um, is a spectrum. Patients with a better prognosis are the ones with, that have the uh, sphincter or the, um, the malformation further down, so it's lower. So perineal fistula, a vestibular fistula, or a bulbar fistula for a male has a better prognosis, as well as a cloaca, a short common channel cloaca, as defined as less than three centimeters has a better prognosis as opposed to some patients, a male with a prostatic fistula or a bladder neck fistula or a female patient with a cloaca that's greater than three centimeters. And this is important to know in the adult patients when they come to see you, because this will tell you a bit about what issues they're having and how you can help them. So in uh, connection to what kind of malformation they have, the other things we look at as to their ability to achieve continence are their sacral development and their spine status. We have a sacral ratio that we oftentimes use, and I'll show you that here in just a moment, but patients with a sacral ratio that's greater than 0.7 or higher should potentially have an excellent outcome for continence. However, patients that are less than 0.4 have a poor potential um, ability for continence. We see patients who all the time defy these kind of uh, rules, so to speak. So this is not a hard and fast rule. Um, there's patients with hemisacrum or sacral agenesis, and on the spine status, patients with tethered cord, myelomeningocele, phylum appearance, and uh, including a fatty a thickening of the phylum or lipoma on the phylum. What the sacral ratio is here, and it can be uh, found by, if you ask your uh, radiologist with a um, an sacral x-ray or pelvic x-ray, both AP and lateral, and it's taking a ratio here to define the normal ratio between the posterior and inferior iliac spines and the tip of the sacrum then divided by the denominator, which is the distance between the iliac crest and the posterior and inferior iliac spines. And that can also be looked at from a lateral view as well. You also are, uh, these patients have associated anomalies, including the bacterial uh, screening that gets done. So it's vertebral anomalies, anorectal anomalies, cardiac, tracheoesophageal fistula, the renal, and the uh, limb discrepancies. So these patients get a physical exam in the NICU. They also get a renal ultrasound and a pelvic ultrasound, uh, thorax and abdomen x-ray with a feeding tube in place to look for tracheoesophageal fistula. That feeding tube is just sitting in there uh, at the top of their esophagus or the bottom. Uh, it's not going all the way through to the stomach. That may be a sign of a tracheoesophageal fistula as well as a spinal ultrasound, AP and lateral sacral x-ray, that's typically done within the first 24 hours of life, and then echo, and then getting labs on them as well. The cloacal anomalies are the most severe and complex form of anorectal malformation. This occurs in one in 50,000 live births. The cloaca is a transient organ that becomes divided to separate the GI and the GU tract. However, in these patients, it is not transient and it remains where the urethra, the vagina, and the rectum empty into a single channel with a single perineal orifice. So here's a, a case presentation of how these patients oftentimes present. So you can see this patient has a film um, where they have a feeding tube that doesn't seem to pass into the stomach here, a newborn female infant who's 37 weeks gestation, 3.2 kilograms, there's a concern for anorectal malformation and cloaca. And you can see there's an absence of distal bowel gas here, and it almost seems to have the bowel is being pushed up by some kind of substance into this right upper quadrant. 
and it has a, this space, uh, space filling substance here in the abdomen. So what we need to be concerned about in these patients, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, these patients on ultrasound and the renal ultrasound will have bilateral hydronephrosis and hydrocolpose on the ultrasound and they may have stool on the perineum. So our primary concern for these patients is that hydrocolpose. Generally speaking, this patient you can tell is not intubated, so it's probably not a cardiac issue. The hydronephrosis is something that over time can cause problems, but if we decompress them properly, um, that with a, due to this hydrocolpose, um, you won't have those long-term problems. But if you don't decompress the hydrocolpose, it can use to respiratory issues. They can have to be intubated because of abdominal compartment syndrome. And the esophagus, usually you can, if they have a tracheoesophageal fistula, you have a few days to deal with that as well. So the most pressing concern is that hydrocolpose. So the distension of that hydrocolpose, because they're having that, um, they don't have that egress, may worsen as the infant is unable to pass that meconium, and you need urgent decompression via a vaginostomy to placement as well as, colost as well as a colostomy for these kids, for these babies. So you can see here preoperatively, this is the um, hydrocolpose of the patient distending the abdomen, and on this X-ray, it is this big um, fluid formed here and post procedure where they have the vaginostomy tube placed uh, that allows decompression of that abdomen that was once very full. There are more and more patients being diagnosed pre excuse me, prenatally by MRI. They're able then to have family counseling and get referred to experience center and have a multidisciplinary approach. When we're looking at a patient um, who has a female infant who has no visible anus, this is a good um, thing to remember. It's also helpful to use this kind of backwards to think about adult patients that may come to see, to see you so you can maybe identify perhaps what type of malformation that they had because they oftentimes will not come to you with their operative notes or even knowing um, what they had. So all patients are gonna undergo a bacterial screening and then how many perineal orifices they have is the next step when you're evaluating this in the, the newborn period. So a patient who has three perineal orifices is either gonna be a perineal fistula or vestibular fistula and they can have a primary PSARP. So you notice these patients as adults don't have colostomy scars. However, if a patient um, has two perineal orifices, that can mean that they have no fistula, that they have vaginal atresia or rectal vaginal fistula. If they have vaginal atresia or rectal vaginal fistula, then they need a colostomy. And those patients as adults will have, obviously have a colostomy scar after they have their uh, secondary surgery performed. If there's no fistula, there needs to be a cross-table radiograph performed in the first 24 hours of life to allow the gas pattern to reach um, kind of as distal as possible. And this will tell you if the rectum is reachable through a posterior sagittal incision, and then they can have a primary PSARP. If it's not reachable, or if their gas, distal gas pattern is still fairly high, they uh, have to have a colostomy. And then if a patient only has one perineal orifice, then they're a cloaca. They need to have that renal pelvic ultrasound on day of life one to look at that hydrocolpose. They may have hydrocolpose with hydronephrosis, and if that's the case, they need a vaginostomy with colostomy. Um, if there's no hydrocolpose, then they can just have a colostomy. <coughs> Excuse me. But they do need to undergo a cloacogram with cystoscopy for operative planning at some point after, after the colostomy is done. So here are patients uh, with a cloaca. Cloaca patients um, will have very differing types of gynecologic anatomy. Here on the left is a patient with a single cervix and a single vagina. The patient on the right here has a septum and two vaginas and two uteri, two cervices. Uh, so they're didelphus uterus. So this is very important for the adult patients, what this means for their fertility, for their mode of delivery and those kind of things. So it's important to know these uh, things for your patient. When you're planning the reconstruction in the infant with cloaca, they undergo an examiner anesthesia with cystovaginoscopy, as well as a 3D and 2D cloacogram, depending on the availability at the center. And it's a multi uh, multidisciplinary team approach involving colorectal urology and gynecology. And it occurs usually between four to 12 months of age after the baby has grown a little bit. So that first period of time, it's just important to get the colostomy done and get the vaginostomy. Let the baby go home, especially if they have bacterial, they may need other things sorted out first. And then the colon part can be taken care of uh, 
at, uh, later. So operative considerations for a cloaca is to measure the common channel, and this is done during that EUA and cysto. The rectum needs to be separated from the urogenital tract, and the urogenital sinus is managed to recreate the urethral orifice and a vaginal introitus. The length of the urethra is vital to decide between these two main surgical maneuvers, and it's whether they have a total urogenital mobilization or a TUM or a urogenital separation. The total urogenital mobilization or TUM is where the common channel is less than three centimeters and the urethra is at least 1.5 centimeters. A TUM and a PSARP may require a laparoscopic approach or an open approach, depending if the rectum is high. A urogenital separation, however, is where the common channel is greater than three centimeters or the urethra is less than 1.5 centimeters. The common channel in this case is kept as urethra and then a PSAR or posterior sagittal anal rectoplasty is then performed. A proportion of these patients require vaginal replacement of the colon, rectum, or small bowel. Open or MIS techniques may be required in these cases, especially where rectum and urogenital confluence lies above the pubococcygeal line. Some of these patients do not have a vagina, and they might need a vaginal replacement related to the length of their urethra. So when we're deciding what conduit to use, it's either colon, ileum, or rectum. The colon, typically the sigmoid, is the first option. It has a thinner pedicle, and it's easier to mobilize the perineum. The ileum does have a delicate pedicle, and especially in these, um, these small infants, it's especially if they're premature, it's this very small pedicle. And it can be a difficult mobilization, and there is more mucus secretion long term. We don't really use the rectum much anymore, and this is only to be used if their potential for bowel control is very poor, like in a patient with myelomeningocele, or if they have a very long common channel or an absent sacrum. However, as I mentioned before, oftentimes these patients surprise us when they come back and see us um, as older children or teenagers. So it's hard to, it's really hard to predict what their potential for bowel control is going to be uh, long term. So we we try not to, to um, put too much relevance, perhaps, in some of the things that we've used in the past, because we've had lots of patients that we think should have poor potential for bowel control, but they're actually somehow doing quite well. So this is a demonstration of the multidisciplinary team that we have at Nationwide. And as you can say, as you can see here, it's really a village. Uh, to take care of these very complex patients. These are, this is a picture that includes the urologists, the colorectal surgeons, gynecologists, our nurses, our nurse practitioners, our schedulers, it includes our social work team, our psychiatry team, um, our child life team. So it really takes a village to manage these patients. This is our gynecology team on the left and our urology team on the right who um, are very closely uh, working with us on these patients. Excuse me. So, how we do a cloacogram during the anorectal, um, the EUA for these patients, the exam under anesthesia, we place catheters. So, you can see here, we've placed a catheter in the common channel and a balloon that goes into the bladder here. This is the vagina, this is the rectum. And then they go down to fluoroscopy. And under fluoroscopy, they inject contrast into uh, these areas. There's typically also mucus fistula where the uh, colostomy is, and we retrograde inject uh, contrast there. And so that allows us to do our operative planning. It takes a lot to plan these operations for these patients. So here the, we've measured out this common channel, and that tells us if we're going to do a total urogenital mobilization or um, if they're going to have a, a separation. So we do these 3D cloacograms for these patients, and it's a reconstruction of that 3D fluoroscopy that you've just seen there. Not all centers have this, but it does allow us to have much better operative planning. These are just some of the tools we use for these patients because it is very complex. We want to know how many vaginas there are. We want to know as much information as, as we can. And if there's hydronephrosis, as you've seen here on these kidneys here, there's a lot of hydronephrosis. Um, and where the rectum is inserting uh, uh, for these patients. So these are just some of the tools we use for our preoperative planning. This again is just a um, computer model that we can turn around and uh, see where the, um, where the structures are inserting. So short common channel, long common channel are some of the, the salient points that's important to know about these patients. When you have these patients present to you um, when they've already had their operation, whether it's soon after the operation as a child or as an adult, you want to know what their relevant history is, um, what their presenting problem is, 
<laughs> if they have fecal incontinence, um, if they're having constipation or soiling, a lot of these patients with anorectal rectal malformation will have baseline constipation. Their colon still doesn't function well, even with the best circumstances. So you, virtually all of these patients need some kind of long-term constipation management. And oftentimes, depending on what their spine is, their sacrum is, and um, what kind of malformation they had, they may have fecal incontinence because they don't have those sphincter muscles. And they may, even if they have them, they may be very poorly formed. They may, may be very rudimentary sphincter muscles so that even with the best surgery in the, uh, the rectum is now within that sphincter complex, that sphincter muscle complex may be very weak. Um, some of these patients will also have flat bottoms, they'll have no sacrum, and that will pretend to um, uh, a higher uh, risk of fecal incontinence and poor quality of life. You want to know if you can, what they're, if they have a colostomy, what kind of previous repair they had. If they have an antegrade option, some of these patients will already have had a Malone placed, which is um, where you have the antegrade flush performed for enemas, uh, where you take the appendix, and it's kind of like doing a Nissen, um, where you have a, you do a wrap with the cecum using the appendix and sew that up to the belly button or to the right lower quadrant, depending on what other urologic reconstruction they've had. Sometimes um, they've got a Monty as well, uh, the urology reconstruction, but it's where they place a catheter in that appendicostomy and they can do an antegrade flush in order to be continent for stool and clean on x-ray and clean in underwear in between their flushes. That can also be done through a secostomy as well if sometimes urology needs the appendix for that Monty. So it's important to know um, how if they have that procedure and then how to kind of manage them postoperatively. They may also have the Vactoral or Vodder Association, what their stool status is, their urinary status, if they're having multiple histories of urinary tract infections, urinary leakage or dribbling, what kind of urologic reconstruction they had, as well as what their nutritional status is. Um, and there, we're finding much more details uh, from these patients um, about the, um, the medical trauma that they've gone through as patients. So it's also important to know I think I would add also to this their psychological history because there's a lot of PTSD, there's a lot of anxiety and depression from these chronically ill patients. And then also their gynecologic history. We need to know what their gynecologic anatomy is. is a, lot, a lot of times these patients come to me for mode of delivery discussion or for fertility discussions to my gynecologic um, uh, partners, but to us for the mode of delivery, whether that's going to be a C-section or a vaginal delivery. So in doing the diagnostic evaluation, when the patients come to see us, um, and we're a quaternary referral center, so we oftentimes get patients who might have been operated on elsewhere and they're having issues, they um, come to see us, or as an adult, they come to see us. Um, so the sacral evaluation, again, looking at the AP and lateral x-ray for that sacral ratio, doing a spine evaluation, if that has never been done before or it's unknown, looking at the MRI of spine, and then looking at renal function with ultrasound, sister urethrogram, your dynamics and cystoscopy. A pelvic MRI, looking for previous repair, presacral mass as well. And some of these patients, they also may have a um, have had a presacral mass reception, and then you have to see if it's maybe come back if it wasn't complete. The clonic anatomy can also be uh, looked at doing a distal clostogram. Sometimes this is in the patient the infant who has had a, um, a colostomy performed and they have a mucous fistula and they haven't had their, their second surgery or their repair yet. <coughs> um, the contrast study in a repaired patient um, who's had their surgery or as an adult can then be done through a per rectum or if they have a Malone or secostomy, you can do an antegrade study. And this is helpful and very uh, useful to look for any kind of dilation stricture to see how much colon they have left and that can help determine how you take care of them. Now, moving on to our next topic here um, is Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung's occurs in one in 5,000 live births. There is a congenital absence of intramural ganglion cells, and this acts as a functional intestinal obstruction. These patients present as failure to pass meconium in the first 48 hours of life, and in older children, and that's defined um, kind of a late onset Hirschsprung's is defined as anyone over the age of 10, um, it 
presents as constipation that is not well managed. These patients will have obstructive symptoms. And as you can see here in these diagrams, the, it's usually the distal part of the rectum or sigmoid or descending colon that does not have the ganglion cells. And um, so here, this is a longer segment of Hirschsprung's uh, that has a ganglionosis. So there are two main types of Hirschsprung's disease. There's short segment disease. It's the most common. It occurs in 80% of patients, most often affected only in the rectum or the sigmoid. And it's four times more common in men than women. There's long segment of disease. It's the most severe type and it occurs in 20% of cases. This affects men and women equally. And the small intestine can miss ganglionated segments as well, where they, patients can also have total intestinal A ganglionosis. Luckily, this is rare, but that can be very difficult to treat. But it is something to think about, especially in patients who are coming to see you who have had Hirschsprung's disease, have had their operation, and they're still struggling. So sometimes these things are missed. 5 to 10% of patients have total colonic aganglionosis. It's usually associated with the genetic predisposition. The RET oncogene or the RET gene, the EDNRB, EDNR3 gene are the important ones to know. Typically, the RET one is what's um, talked about for the board exam, so I just want to highlight that. Um, it's a dominant pattern of inheritance. One copy of altered gene may be sufficient to cause the disorder, and there can be incomplete penetrance as well. So not everyone who inherits the altered gene from a parent develops Hirschsprung's. Unfortunately, we cannot perform accurate prenatal diagnosis at this time. However, we, were, we are working on this at our center. The concepts of continence are important when you're thinking about your surgical repair. You want to maintain the anal canal sensation and preserve that dentate line, which is the ability to differentiate between gas, liquid, and solid stool. You also want to pre uh, preserve the sphincters, the internal and the external, and the motility for the patient, the presence of normal-sized ganglion cells, so less than 40 micron nerves. The preoperative contrast studies are shown here of what this might look like, and it's typically the Hirschsprung's disease a rectum and colon is the small uh, colon, and it's the dilated colon that's the abnormal colon because it's been trying to work through this kind of obstruction here, so it dilates upstream. Um, when Hirschsprung first um, made this, uh, the determination of Hirschsprung's disease, he actually kind of got it wrong. He thought the abnormal bowel was the dilated bowel, and this small bowel was the normal bowel. So um, he's actually wrong, fun fact. Um, and then here is another contrast study. Again, this shows what we, this helps you determine how long the segment of Hirschsprung's disease is. And so this tells you that this is the transition point here where it's transitioning from that large dilated colon and then that smaller distal colon here. And that can sometimes tell you if you're gonna be able to do this transanal only or you're gonna need a laparoscopic approach as well. Again, here's another contrast study that shows the transition zone. Uh, it's a little bit lower on this patient and then that really dilated um, proximal segment. The patients up to about one year of age are typically diagnosed with a suction rectal biopsy as shown here, but over the age of one and in adults, it needs to be done diagnosed with full thickness rectal biopsy. And that's because we're evaluating for the presence of ganglion cells and those ganglion cells are present in the submucosa. That is also why you cannot diagnose Hirschsprung's on um, a colonoscopy. I see patients sent to me all the time um, with colonoscopy biopsies that are only of the mucosa, so that is not as helpful. It also, on the full thickness rectal biopsy, we're evaluating the size of the ganglion cells in the microns. So we want to have um, nerve cells that are less than 40 microns. Another way to diagnose Hirschsprung's disease or to not completely diagnose, but to rule it out in adults or uh, patients usually older than three or four years old is with an anal rectal manometry. So you will have a negative rare on a patient who has Hirschsprung's that does not necessarily completely diagnose Hirschsprung's disease because you can also have patients who have constipation and they have a very large dilated rectum and if the balloon just isn't blown up enough to when during the anal rectal manometry, um, you're not going to guess that, um, that rare, that um, 
that relaxing anal uh, inhibitory reflex. So that's important to know that a negative rare doesn't necessarily diagnose Hirschsprung. The next step is for full thickness rectal biopsy. However, if you are seeing patients and that you're concerned about the possible diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease, you can first start with anal rectal manometry. And that's typically where I start as well. So here are some slides of some uh, control, the ganglionated segment and the aganglionated uh, segment as well. So you can see here, these are the ganglia and an aganglionic segment. Those are missing the ganglia. The management until these patients go to surgery include rectal irrigations. If you can properly um, teach the parents how to irrigate that distal segment of colon that's not working properly and prevent enterocolitis, then you can postpone the surgical uh, treatment. However, sometimes if um, the family is unable to perform those rectal irrigations or the patient, the baby's not tolerating them well, or you're still getting enterocolitis, you may need to do the operation sooner. It's a lot more difficult to do the surgery in a newborn. So we do prefer to wait if we can till the baby gets a little bit uh, older. Um, it can be done in the newborn period, but sometimes it can be more difficult. The definitive surgical treatment can be either transanal or laparoscopic assisted. And some patients do need a colostomy or an ileostomy, particularly if they're a total colonic or a long segment Hirschsprung's patient. Um, for a long segment Hirschsprung's patient, you may need to do a colonic derotation or rotate uh, the right colon down to on the right side. And you're gonna be relying on that very small vessel pedicle. And when they're a newborn, it's tiny and you really need to wait for that to be longer. So that's where uh, an ileostomy uh, is typically done on those patients. If it's a colostomy, then you need to have a leveling colostomy and you need to make sure the colostomy is above the area of a ganglionated segments. Otherwise, the colostomy won't work and the patient will still get um, uh, enterocolitis. And patients, unfortunately, still get very sick from enterocolitis very quickly. Um, so it's very important to try and prevent this. So the type of surgeries that are done for Hirschsprungs include the Swenson, the Duhamel, and the Suave. And we'll go through those here. The Swenson pull-through is a full thickness perineal resection with coloanal anastomosis. This um, procedure, as you can see done here, is done. Here is the, the sphincter complex, and this is the dentate line. The operation starts two to three centimeters above that dentate line. So you are preserving the dentate line, you're preserving those sphincters, and then you're anastomosing healthy bowel right above that dentate line. And you also, during that surgery, of course, will send uh, biopsies frozen to have the pathologist look for ganglion cells and also look for uh, nerves. You want, again, less than 40 hypertrophic nerves on your pull-through segment. In the Suave procedure, it's an extra mucosal dissection of the rectum with pull-through of the ganglionated colon through this aganglionic muscle cuff. The reason why this was done is to... Um, decrease the risk of causing damage to those sphincter muscles. And so um, this muscle cuff is left behind and then the anastomosis is brought through that muscular cuff. <coughs> the Duhamel procedure is a rectal retromobilization leaving diseased rectum in situ. So here, the ganglionated bowel is delivered through an incision in the posterior aspect of the aganglionic rectum, and the septum is then divided with a stapler. So this posterior aspect here is going to be aganglionic. It's going to be the Hirschsprung's disease, and then they're going to bring that uh, ganglionated bowel through. This is sometimes more often used for total colonic Hirschsprung's patients. So sometimes where you're bringing, they have very little colon left, or they have um, just small bowel being brought down to do this anastomosis. So if you're doing a repeat biopsy on these patients, you wanna make sure you're biopsying the right part. You wanna make sure you're biopsying the ganglionated bowel or anterior, posterior, know that it's intentionally aganglionic. I think it's important to know some of the history here. And I think it's also important for us to kind of right the wrongs of our, our predecessors. So this is uh, Asa Yancey, 
He is a surgeon. And Yancey wrote about an idea to modify the Swenson in 1952, a decade prior to Suave's publication. However, as a black surgeon, his report was not allowed to be published in the main surgical journals. And as you can see here, it was published in 1952. And in 1964, a surgeon named Suave published his version of a new surgical technique for Hirschsprung's disease. So in our um, Pediatric Colorectal Learning Consortium, or, or PCPLC, there has been a call to action to rename this the Yancey Suave procedure and give credit where credit is due. So hopefully that's something that we as a society and we as a, a pediatric colorectal surgeons uh, can right that wrong. So this is a patient at our center, we do uh, Swenson procedures, uh, typically, almost exclusively. The procedure is done in a prone uh, position, and then the dentate line is hidden here um, with the Lone Star pins and that Lone Star retractor. We make a uh, incision, as you can see here, um, again, the, the dentate line is hidden with those Lone, lone Star pins, and we start making the incision um, to about two centimeters away from that dentate line, so we have something to sew to. But you can do a lot. I uh, bring this up just to illustrate how through these uh, pediatric patients, you can do really do a lot transanally, similar to how uh, we do um, some of our, our own uh, resections for, for rectal prolapse uh, procedures. Um, you can really take a lot out, uh, colon, uh, transanally here. And while we're doing the operation, we take biopsies along the way um, to confirm uh, that we have the right spot, <clears throat> that we have a uh, ganglionated uh, colon, and we are have having the um, hypertrophic nerves uh, that are less than 40 microns. So we're not sewing in a transition zone pull through because those patients will have obstruction. So this is just merely merely illustrate, uh, you can get a lot out transanally. So when patients come to you and they're having issues, they're having presenting problems, you want to know what that problem is. Is it a problem of soiling or obstruction? Patients can have the first rungs, even if they have a perfect operation, they still oftentimes have constipation similar to the anorectal malformation. So oftentimes they need to be on a lifelong constipation uh, management strategy. They can also be getting enterocolitis as well. And that's typically if there's some kind of obstruction. So if they're having obstructions, you need to figure out why. You also need to know what their past medical history is, what the age of diagnosis, what their transition zone was, what their current stooling status is, their nutritional status. Sometimes patients come to us and they're very nutritionally deplete. They need an ileostomy to kind of uh, get back on their feet. You need, <coughs> excuse me. You need to also know if they've had a colostomy in the past that can tell you um, what kind of repair that they've had. Um, that can tell you the length of the operation of the transition zone. Um, if they had a colostomy, they're more likely to have been a longer segment Hirschsprungs. The type of previous repair, whether it's a Swenson, a Duham, L, or Suave, will also help you. <coughs> For these patients, um, we oftentimes, again, get a contrast study. And this tells us anatomically if they have a stricture, an anatomic twist, um, if there's something from a surgical standpoint that needs a revision. It can also tell us if they've had a, a suave cuff. You can also feel the suave cuff on digital rectal exam during their anorectal exam under anesthesia. And if they have a retained suave cuff that's causing obstructive symptoms, then that, need, that cuff needs to be taken out. There are plenty of patients that have had a suave and that retained um, muscle cuff doesn't cause obstructive symptoms, but it can. And if the patient's having enterocolitis and they have a suave cuff, it needs to be removed. The other uh, consideration is a patient with a Duhamel pouch. This Duhamel pouch, similarly to a J pouch, um, can stretch over time and have difficulty emptying. Again, it's important to remember in a Duhamel, this is a ganglionated pouch that has the ganglionated bowel kind of plugged into it. So sometimes patients aren't going to empty this well. And if that's the case, that Duhamel pouch needs to be resected. And similarly to a J pouch, it's a very hard operation to go back in and carve that Duhamel pouch out, uh, but can be done. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
The other issue to consider is a pathologic problem. They could have a transition zone pull through. So perhaps they had um, the pathology was incorrect. They may have a ganglionotic a segment of colon left behind or Hirschsprung's disease left behind, or they may have greater than 40 microns and have a transition zone pull through where that colon just isn't going to function properly. Um, so that is my talk and I will open it up for any questions. And I thank you all for uh, your attentive listening. Thank you very much. Um, while we are getting ready for questions to come in, I actually wanted to repeat a question I had for you earlier before anyone else was on, um, which is how many surgeons, both in our country and elsewhere, have a similar clinical practice to you? And like, what is your clinical practice breakdown? And then are there room for more peds, adult colorectal surgeons? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, so there are very few uh, people who have followed my, my similar pathway. There is a surgeon um, who did uh, pediatric general surgery. Uh, and, and prior to that, uh, she did adult uh, colorectal surgery. And she started a transition practice in the Washington, D.C. area. And then there is also a, a surgeon out in Germany um, who had a similar pathway who did pediatric colorectal surgery and adult colorectal surgery. So there are very few people who follow this pathway. Um, my practice is 70% pediatric colorectal surgery, 30% adult colorectal surgery, although I, I do say that number kind of fluctuates. I think that's a number on paper and it really depends where the need is. Um, certainly I, if I'm having consults or um, that is something that's uh, uh, definitely a, a needle that moves. And I think there is definitely room for more people who follow this pathway or who have an interest in both adult colorectal and pediatric congenital colorectal surgery. There certainly is a very large volume of patients. As we know, patients with Bactra are living longer and longer than they ever did. And they are, are suffering, truly suffering in silence. There are a lot of adult patients um, who have come to us to say, excuse me, um, that before they knew about our center, um, had gone to lots of different uh, adult colorectal surgeons and adult general surgeons, and they were all told the same thing, you just need a stoma. And they would then come to us at, at our center and find out that there are other things besides a stoma, and there are other things in bowel management we can do for them, and get them the quality of life that they're looking for without another operation. A lot of these patients come to us with I mean, an extraordinary number of surgeries because they have quite a bit going on. There's some patients with 20 to 30 operations. So you can imagine that's a difficult hostile abdomen. But sometimes some of these patients do need a colostomy. But there is very much a need um, for, this, for this transitional care practice. And I do think that um, it'd be wonderful to have more people out there who are uh, practicing adult transitional care and are able to take care of this very vulnerable and much needed, um, uh, much needed practice. I think there is, um, you have to definitely have support from the two institutions. I work at a pediatric hospital, I work at an adult hospital, and you need to have support from both, um, both ends to kind of make sure that they're supporting what your goals are. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shanker had a comment from Sir John uh, and a question. She said, for these patients with anorectal malformations with fecal incontinence in adulthood, do you do anorectal manometry or sacral nerve stimulator? Does it depend? So it is sometimes helpful, I think, to have anorectal manometry done in these patients. Um, initially, you know, it starts with a... Um, looking back if you can at their operative notes. And sometimes it's just patching what their scars are because oftentimes they don't have their operative notes with them. They don't know what surgeries they've had. And doing a good physical exam in the office, some of these patients you can tell have a very flat bottom. They don't have a spine when you do your digital rectal exam. And when you ask them to squeeze or bear down and doing your pelvic floor exam, they really don't have any sphincters there um, and they, may not have much of a pelvic floor to speak of. So doing anorectal manometry, we don't have a lot of, I suppose similarly in our, in our adult patients with pelvic floor issues, um, we don't have a lot of data to say 
um, you know, who in pelvic floor needs anorectomanometry prior to operation and stuff. Similarly to our anorectal malformation patients, anorectal manometry, we don't have a lot of data for them. We are capturing that at our, at our transitional care center. Um, <clears throat> but I do have them usually, if, I, if it's something feasible to do, do anorectal manometry so they can um, have an assessment of what their pelvic floor is and what their potential perhaps um, for having better continence. There are some patients where the anoplasty was placed in the wrong spot. So their sphincter muscles are here, but their anoplasty was done here. So obviously their potential is going to be somewhat poor if the anoplasty isn't in the wrong, isn't in the right place. So sometimes it's a surgical revision that's needed. We have done sacral nerve stimulators in these patient populations. It's usually our last step. Um, first, we try bowel management for these patients, and whether it's a retrograde with a Navina or Peristeme, large volume enema system. We found that's very successful for the fecal incontinence. And, um, or if they already have a Malone or they have a psychostomy, uh, some patients prefer to have the retrograde system versus have another surgery and have an anterograde or psychostomy. Um, and we find that we, we uh, recently published where we had in our adult bowel management program that 85% of the patients who went through the program had in, uh, improved quality of life and improved um, uh, fecal incontinence scores after the bowel management program. So we do that first. In some patients that aren't, don't fall in that category, then sacral nerve stimulators can be an option. And again, it's usually in our algorithm of um, doing the uh, bowel management uh, and perhaps an anterograde or retrograde program or a sacral nerve stimulator if that fails prior to doing an ostomy. So hopefully that answers the question appropriately. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Dr. Hill. She says, for adult patients with prior pediatric procedures, who do you think benefits the most from a referral to a surgeon like you? And also, do you do video consultations for patients who do not have the financial or time ability to travel? So I think patients who are struggling, of course, um, benefit the most to seeing uh, someone who's used to taking care of patients and used to getting them out of trouble. I've had patients who um, have been complete shut-ins because of their bowel issues that they're having and aren't able to work, they're on disability, and then we're able to help them solve their problems and see what's going on with them to get them back on the pathway and really give them their life back. And it really has been that life-changing for a lot of patients. So certainly that is the type of patient that uh, we prefer to see. There are also patients who have had their reconstruction with a neovagina, and they may have a vaginal, neovagina, vaginal and troidal stenosis. They may have a septum that was never taken down. Um, so that is another good patient who can some, should come see us because then we do, it's usually colon that's brought down through the neovagina. So that's a, a good combo procedure with a um, gynecologist and a colorectal surgeon to give that patient um, the uh, opportunity to have uh, intercourse if that's what they're desiring or to have vaginal egress uh, for menstruation as well. So um, certainly when you're talking about those patients, having a multidisciplinary approach is very important. And we have that support at our multidisciplinary center. We have the same amount of support on the pediatric side as we do on the adult side as well with our multidisciplinary team. Um, video consultations for patients who don't have the financial time and ability to travel. How it works at our center is that, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Um, <clears throat> so how it works at our center is we have um, a very well-established pathway when a patient gets referred to us who has anorectal malformation or Hirschsprung's or congenital colorectal disorder. We have a new intake process where we gather all of their information. A nurse calls them and spends a lot of time with them on the phone and then tries to track down as much of the operative information or imaging or testing that they've already have done. It gets collated into one, um, one document and then we review that as an entire uh, group with the, um, the surgeons, the nurse practitioners and the nurses, social work, psychology sometimes if it's necessary. And we review their entire uh, pathway um, and what their problems are and uh, we determine how we can best serve them and de develop a plan. And then that plan gets relayed back to the patient. We usually have a phone call as the surgeon, have a phone call with that patient, just a preliminary kind of introduction 
and then see what barriers are for traveling for them. We have a great insurance team that can sometimes work with them with their insurance. Um, certainly during COVID, it was a lot easier to do some of these visits, um, but we did as much as we could in states that are allowing us to still do telehealth for these patients. We are still doing that as much as possible. Um, or I'm very much, we oftentimes will work with the local team to help, uh, if they have a very motivated local team, work with them and see what, what options are available for them. So we've done kind of hybrid options um, of only kind of meeting people virtually or um, helping people to travel to see us in person as well. That's wonderful. Uh, our next question is from Dr. Garcia. She says, for those of us only adult trained around what age or size do you think we should draw the line, especially if there are not many, if any, pediatric surgeons in the area or other patient factors may restrict travel and access? And follow-up question would be, what factors do you think are important to consider, not even necessarily for congenital issues, but for Crohn's or FAP, et cetera? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, ultimately, it's about getting the patient the best care that you can. You may find that even if there are um, pediatric centers or pediatric surgeons in your area, you as an adult colorectal surgeon may have a lot more experience in doing a J pouch for an FAP patient um, or dealing with I complex IBD um, or anorectal fistulas that they just don't have the same training, of course, the, the complex colorectal training that adult colorectal surgeon has. Um, certainly, there are issues of what your hospital allows you to do um, in your own uh, facility. I know it, in our center, or in, um, it's a little different for me because I'm, I'm um, able to operate at both institutions, but I know uh, some of my uh, pediatric surgery partners will have an adult colorectal surgeon join them at the pediatric hospital to do a complex J pouch surgery. So they'll operate together. And that's certainly an option. Um, there are some hospitals have restrictions that our, our, our hospital at OSU, it's 15 years old is the cutoff um, to operate on a pediatric patient. Anything beyond that, we need special privileges and special accommodations because it's all it's about the anesthetic team. So that may be a barrier too because it's not just about your ability to perform the surgery, but it's about the anesthesia team and their um, willingness to put the patient to sleep and then deal with any kind of post-operative complications. So it may mean working outside of what the norms are. We, I, As I said, a lot of our pediatric colorectal centers um, operate with adult surgeons where they go, <clears throat> they will sometimes pediatric surgeon will go to the adult center to operate if the patient is kind of of age, but it makes more sense if they need kind of a pediatric surgery eye for Hirschsprung's or anorectal malformation or vice versa, have the adult colorectal surgeon go operate with the pediatric surgeon in the pediatric place, if that's the place that makes the best sense to give the home for the patient. But I think you, you have to consider lots of different factors. Um, <clears throat> as you're speaking of, you know, not necessarily these congenital issues, the Crohn's FAP, or if you have a patient with Lynch syndrome, and where are they best going to get their care? Sometimes it's, it's the surgical care um, is one thing, and then it's the post-operative care. What are the other support systems available for these patients going through, you know, these very rough times? Uh, pediatric hospitals have a lot more resources. Um, they have the, the psychiatric resources. They have the child's life resources. And they're going to be able to take care of a pediatric patient and understand how to, how to manage them much better than an adult hospital. So in, in, even in my practice, <clears throat> when I have a 15-year-old who has Lynch syndrome and has an obstructing colon mass um, that I need to take out, and I think to myself, where is this patient best, best um, taken care of? It is sometimes that pediatric hospital, although you know, they have a very adult problem. So I think it's, it's a gray area. I, you know, it's, it's very situational specific. Um, and I think it depends on the situation that the patient is in. So I don't have a like a perfect answer for you, but hopefully uh, that tells you a little bit what I consider when I'm thinking about where to operate on these patients, because I certainly have the ability to take them both places. Um, but to me, it's it's a very much a multifactorial decision. And ultimately I decide where the patient is going to have the best support 
um, that is, and where they are gonna have the best outcome. And then we have to really advocate for the patients and make it happen, even if it's kind of out of our comfort zone. And sometimes that means um, reaching out to pediatric surgeons. Sometimes that means willing to operate at another location to get the patient the very best outcome that they deserve. Thank you. That was a very good answer for the shades of gray that you were talking about. <laughs> Um, another question that I had is actually a question I've had for a couple of years. Is a Swenson procedure different from an Altmeyer other than the biopsies that you do for the leveling? No, I mean, I really think it's it's the most similar. Um, and I was kind of getting at that during my talk, talking about our rectal prolapse transanal <clears throat> procedures. But um, yes, an Altmeyer is essentially a Swenson. You're operating just above the dentate line and you're sticking right on the colon, pulling it down as much as you can. So that's very much, uh, or a, uh, <clears throat> a hand-sewn coloanal operation as well. It's very, very much a Swenson. And, um, and Matt, oh, sorry, Matt, Matt, this is Tess Allett. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just gonna jump in with a question if that's okay. Thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I had a patient recently who had, um, was sent to me for um, you know negative rare on anorectal manometry, um, not like a slam dunk by history for Hirschsprung. So I did take um, for you know full thickness rectal biopsy, and I'm just wondering. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but from like a technical standpoint for an an adult patient, like how um, what is kind of your technical approach? Do you just do it in one area? How you know far from the dentate line for these full thickness biopsies um, if you're trying to rule out you know ultra short segment Hirschsprung's disease? Yeah, and it can be a very difficult thing. I mean, we say full thickness rectal biopsy is super easy, but it's not because um, <clears throat> these patients are oftentimes, they've been constipated for a very long time. Um, they have a very dilated rectum. It's probably thickened rectum as well. So getting a full thickness biopsy in this very thick rectum is not an easy task. And they also have these really big hemorrhoids typically too. So you, I use the Lone Star Retractor just like we would in pediatric uh, patients. Um, <clears throat> have them in lithotomy. It's a procedure that's you know done under anesthesia, just to be clear. Um, and I make sure to tell my anesthesiologists that these you know, it can't be like a gentle max. They're like, oh, you're just doing a rectal biopsy. It's very important. These pins, if they cough, they can tear, right? So, you know, just like when we're using them for other procedures, we want to make sure we share the same expectations with the anesthesiologist because they may think, you know, biopsy, rectum, super simple. Um, so, and again, as you mentioned, it has to be um, two centimeters above the dentate line. I usually, I mean, I get a ruler, the little plastic malleable ruler and I um, actually measure where I'm gonna take my biopsies from. Um, and I sometimes take multiple biopsies, but I think it's important um, to make sure you have good uh, retraction of the actual biopsy specimen. So where I choose where I'm gonna make the uh, biopsy from. And above that, just like you're kind of doing a hemorrhoid, um, I use 2 ovicryl and put a big stitch above that. And I leave the needle on because it's gonna bleed like stink. And I leave the, um, the needle driver up there with with kind of taken away with a Lone Star because I'm going to use that to close the wound. Um, <clears throat> and then I put a stay suture where my rectal biopsy is actually going. And you can tie that down, take the needle off of that. <clears throat> and then uh, distally, I also have another suture um, <clears throat> to tie to. So I put another suture there, leave the needle on there and leave that, um, that needle driver in place. And then I, so I've got those, those three kind of triangulated areas. And that middle part is where the rectal biopsy is coming from. So you can pull up on it because <clears throat> it's got that suture there. And that's going to allow you to have a better full thickness rectal biopsy. You need a good assistant because as soon as you make that cut in this very thick rectum, it's going to bleed quite a bit. So you make that full thickness cut. <clears throat> Sometimes when it's so thick, because the worst thing you want to do is then get the specimen back and it's not full thickness. You don't have that submucosa. So sometimes when you're pulling up on that retraction stitch, you can put another deeper stitch to, so you really make sure you get submucosa and go in with really sharp mets and I make the biopsy triangulated like this. But it's important when you're, you're cutting down that you're not coming across and you're really getting down to that apex. So sometimes when I make my first cut, <clears throat> then pull up on that retraction stitch, put another stitch to really pull up on it. So you make sure you're getting that full thickness and then come under with your mets 
Of course, you have to do it sharply because you don't want the um, artifact from the bogey. And then once you have that specimen, then close it up. And hopefully you have a good pathology team who can really take a look at that, look for hypertrophic nerves, look for ganglion cells as well, because we've you know, done all that work. Um, and then the patients, it's important postoperatively that you really have them on some kind of a bowel regimen that does not include enemas sometimes for the first few days. So you can allow that area to heal and not get as similar as you would for hemorrhoid surgery. Uh, but re really great question. I think that's something that we kind of um, underestimate and how simple it's going to be in our minds. And then you get there and you're doing it and then you get the specimen back. And if it's, it's you know, it doesn't show that adequate specimen, you have to bring the patient back and that can be, um, you know, difficult to explain to them. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I think, like you said, you know, reading all the textbooks, it's like, oh, two centimeters, but you know, um, this in this one particular patient, it's kind of like, well, if I don't get it in the right spot, and it's negative, is that a sampling error on my part, um, you know, for this person to get to where they are um, this far out? Obviously, it's not a long segment. It's, you know, so, you know, right. trying to really figure that out. I ended up doing, <clears throat> I like your description of the triangle. I kind of did like a strip um, and, you know, we got an adequate sample and it was, you know, not Hirschsprung's, but um, thank you. That's very helpful. You're welcome. Absolutely. I had one more question, but I also did a biopsy for Hirschsprungs a couple months ago, actually. So it is not super uncommon. Um, what can we fellows do now that we have a little bit more than half a fellowship left to best prepare to care for patients that we will see in our future practice that have congenital colorectal pathophysiology? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's something that as I went throughout my interview trail for adult colorectal surgery and brought to, to people kind of what my plan um, <clears throat> of what my practice looks like in five years, everyone's eyes lit up and said, gosh, I've had these patients. So it's not rare. Um, and I keep, you know, they say I, I still have these patients. So you're absolutely right. It is very, it's more common than we think that these patients are going to end up in your practice. Ideally, they would not end up in the emergency room with some kind of issue that you're having to sort out on an emergent basis. Um, that happens too, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but I think what we're, we're doing at our center, which is unique, um, is that we have an elective rotation where our adult OSU colorectal fellow goes to Nationwide for a month to learn more about how to take care of these patients. And I think that's the best way to truly set yourself up for the ability to really care for these patients. Outside of that, what we are trying to do with ASCARS um, is have more educational symposiums um, where we can talk about these congenital colorectal patients and how to um, how to care for them long term. Um, we also have an interest group, a pediatric uh, colorectal congenital interest group as well that myself and Dr. Peoples are the co-chairs of, so you can get involved through that. Um, you know, ultimately, as a fellow, your one year is it goes by so fast and they're, you're trying to, of course, drink from that um, fire hydrant. And as, as um, you know, as colorectal surgery has so many different things for you to learn in such a short period of time, of course, the answer is go to clinic, see as much as you can, do as much as you can, because these patients may show up in clinic, they may then go to the operating room, um, but try and talk to your attendings and see do you have patients like this? What have you done for them? Are they coming up to see you and follow up anytime soon? Can I be a part of that conversation and part of that examination? Because sometimes just knowing what to look for on an exam, there are these patients. <clears throat> I had a patient who's a cloaca and had never heard the term cloaca before I said it to her, but I examined her. She had been through many different systems in the past. She was coming to me in her thirties and had never heard the word cloaca. But after my examination, I identified that with her. We talked about her, her uh, surgical scars and we were able, luckily, to get some um, operative reports from when she was a child back in Memphis. And indeed, she was a cloaca. Um, so it's having a good physical exam and having those skills um, to identify those issues. And her anal rectal malformation is a patient who doesn't have an anal canal. They do not have a dentate line. They do not have hemorrhoids. So you're basically going to see the colon sewn to the skin. It's almost like seeing a stoma on the, on the perineum, really. Some patients will have more than others because it depends on what type of anorectal malformation they had. 
But oftentimes that's what you'll see. And you'll see a patient with a flat bottom. It won't be curved. They'll be missing some, and you can feel on the digital ecto exam, you don't feel that, that sacral spine there, that coccyx. And so you can feel those abnormalities and put that piece that together. So I think it's having that, that good, um, that good phys those physical exam skills, but also, you know, see as much as you can in fellowship, but also knowing that in fellowship, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing educational process. You may not see everything in fellowship for any kind of disease process. There may be things that, you know, you'll learn about as a new attending um, and have that support of your, um, your partners. But certainly, you know, if you come across a patient that you're not sure about, I'm always happy to talk to anybody about, um, you know, work with you locally with your patient um, about what you're seeing, what you're finding, and what kind of workup should be involved. And I oftentimes do that. I'll get an email or um, get a phone call from someone who uh, needs help, um, who's an adult colorectal surgeon who's asking about how to take care of their adult patient. And I'm always happy to help you with that as well. Thank you. And thank you for such a fantastic talk, a lot of material. I don't see any other comments, so we will go ahead and wrap up. Uh, I know I will certainly be watching this at least one more time to fully digest all the, all the content. And before we sign off, I do wanna promote our talk for next week. We will be welcoming Dr. Jennifer Davids, who is currently at UMass, but will be transitioning to be the Chief of Colorectal Surgery at Boston Medical Center next year. She will talk to us about building gender equity in surgery. So thank you, Dr. Geisher, for everything, and everyone have a good night. Thank you as well. Take care.